Man from the South, read by Tom Hollander. It was getting on towards six o'clock, so I thought I'd buy myself a beer and go out and sit in a deck chair by the swimming pool and have a little evening sun. I went to the bar and got the beer and wandered down the garden towards the pool. It was a fine garden with lawns and beds of azaleas and tall coconut palms, and the wind was blowing strongly through the tops of the palm trees, making the leaves hiss and crackle as though they were on fire. There were plenty of deck chairs around the swimming pool, and there were white tables and huge, brightly coloured umbrellas. In the pool itself, there were three or four girls and about a dozen boys, all splashing about and making a lot of noise and throwing a large rubber ball at one another. I stood watching them. The girls were English girls from the hotel. The boys I didn't know about, but they sounded American, and I thought they were probably naval cadets who'd come ashore from the naval training vessel which had arrived in harbour that morning. I went over and sat down under a yellow umbrella where there were four empty seats, and I poured my beer and settled back comfortably with a cigarette. Just then, I noticed a small, oldish man walking briskly around the edge of the pool. He had on a large, creamy Panama hat, and he came bouncing along, looking at the people and the chairs. He stopped beside me and smiled. I smiled back. Excuse me, please, but may I sit here? Certainly, I said. He sat down and crossed his legs. A fine evening, he said. They are all fine evenings here in Jamaica. I couldn't precisely identify the accent, but I felt fairly sure he was some sort of a South American. Yes, I said. It is wonderful here, isn't it? Suddenly, one of the American cadets was standing in front of us. He was dripping wet from the pool, and one of the English girls was standing there with him. Are these chairs taken? He said. No, I answered. Mind if I sit down? Go ahead. Thanks, he said. He had a towel in his hand, and when he sat down, he unrolled it and produced a packet of cigarettes and a lighter. He offered the cigarettes to the girl, and she refused. Then he offered them to me, and I took one. The little man said, "Thank you, no, but I have a cigar." He pulled out a crocodile case and got himself a cigar. Here, let me give you a light. The American boy held up his lighter. That will not work in this wind. Sure, it'll work. It always works. The little man removed his unlighted cigar from his mouth, cocked his head on one side, and looked at the boy. Always. He said slowly, "Sure, it never fails." The little man was still watching the boy. Well, well. So you say this famous lighter it never fails? Is that what you say? Sure, the boy said. That's right. He was about nineteen or twenty, with a long, freckled face and a rather sharp, bird-like nose. He was holding the lighter in his hand, ready to slip the wheel. It never fails. One moment, please. The hand that held the cigar came up high, palm outward, as though it was stopping traffic. Now, just one moment. He kept looking at the boy all the time. Shall we not perhaps make a little bet on that? He smiled at the boy. Sure, I'll bet. The boy said, "Why not?" The little man waved his hand again. Listen to me. Now we have some fun. We go up to my room here in the hotel where there is no wind, and I bet you, you cannot light this famous lighter of yours ten times running without missing once. I'll bet I can. The boy said. I'll make you a very good bet. I am a rich man, and I am sporting man also. Listen to me. Outside the hotel is my car. It's a very fine car. It's an American car from your country, Cadillac. Hey now, wait a minute. The boy leaned back in his deck chair and laughed. I can't put up that sort of property. This is crazy. Not crazy at all. You strike lighter successfully ten times running, and Cadillac is yours. And what do I put up? The little man carefully removed the red band from his still unlighted cigar. 
some small thing you can afford to give away, and if you did happen to lose it, you would not feel too bad, right? Such as what? Such as perhaps the little finger on your left hand. My what? The boy stopped grinning. Yes, why not? You win, you take the car, you lose. I take the finger. I don't get it. How do you mean you take the finger? I chop it off. That's a crazy bet. I think I'll just make it a dollar. The little man gave a tiny contemptuous shrug of the shoulders. Well, 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 he said. I do not understand. You say it lies, but you will not bet. Then we forget it, yes? The boy sat quite still, staring at the bathers in the pool. And I could see that the little man had succeeded in disturbing him with his absurd proposal. What do we do if I lose? Do I have to hold my finger out while you chop it off? Oh no, you might be tempted to refuse to hold it out. Now what I should do, I should tie one of your hands to the table before we started, and I should stand there with a knife ready to go chop the moment your lighter mist. What year is the Cadillac? the boy asked. Last year is quite a new car, but I see you're not a betting man. Americans never are. The boy paused for just a moment, and he glanced first at the English girl, then at me. Yes, he said sharply. I'll bet you. Good. The little man clapped his hands together quietly once. Fine, he said. We do it now. And you, sir? He turned to me. You would perhaps be good enough to, what do you call it, to referee. Well, I said, I think it's a crazy bet. I don't think I like it very much. Nor do I, said the English girl. It was the first time she'd spoken. I think it's a stupid, ridiculous bet. Are you serious about cutting off this boy's finger if he loses? I said. Certainly I am. Also about giving him Cadillac if he wins. Come now, we go to my room. He led the way back through the garden to the hotel. I live in Annex, he said. You like to see the car first? It's just here. He took us to where we could see the front driveway of the hotel, and he stopped and pointed to a sleek, pale green Cadillac parked close by. There she is, the green one. You like? Say, that's a nice car, the boy said. All right. Now we go up and see if you can win her. We followed him into the annex and up one flight of stairs. He unlocked his door and we all trooped into what was a large, pleasant double bedroom. First, we have a little martini. The drinks were on a small table in the far corner, ready to mix. He began to make the martini, but meanwhile he'd rung the bell and now there was a knock on the door and a maid came in. Ah! he said, taking a wallet from his pocket and pulling out a pound note. You will do something for me, please. He gave the maid the pound. You keep that. Now, we are going to play a little game, and I want you to go and find for me three things. I want some nails, I want a hammer, and I want a chopping knife. A butcher's chopping knife, which you can get from the kitchen. A chopping knife? The maid opened her eyes wide. You mean a real chopping knife? Yes, of course. You can find these things surely for me. Yes, sir. I'll try, sir. And she went. The little man handed round the martinis. We stood there and sipped them. I didn't know what to make of it all. The man seemed serious about the bed. But what if the boy lost? Then we'd have to rush him to hospital in the Cadillac that he hadn't won. The little man picked up the shaker and refilled our glasses. Before we begin, he said, I will present to the referee the key of the car. He produced a car key from his pocket and gave it to me. Then the maid came in again. In one hand she carried a small chopper, and in the other a hammer and a bag of nails. Good, you get them all. Now you can go. He waited until the maid had closed the door and then said, Now we prepare ourselves. And to the boy, help me please with this table. We carry it out a little. 
It was the usual kind of hotel writing desk, just a plain rectangular table about four feet by three. They carried it out into the room away from the wall. And now, he said, a chair. He picked up a chair and placed it beside the table. He was very brisk and very animated, like a person organizing games at a children's party. And now we put in the nails. He fetched the nails and began to hammer them into the table. We stood there holding martinis, watching the little man hammer two nails into the table about six inches apart. He didn't hammer them right home. He allowed a small part of each one to stick up. Anyone would think he'd done this before, I told myself. He never hesitates. And now, he said, all we want is some string. He found some. All right, at last we are ready. Will you please sit here at the table, he said to the boy. The boy sat down. Now, place your hand between these two nails. He wound the string around the boy's wrist, then several times around the wide part of the hand. Then he fastened it tight to the nails. When he'd finished, there wasn't any question about the boy being able to take his hand away. Now, please, clench the fist, all except for the little finger. You must leave the little finger sticking out, lying on the table. Excellent. Now we are ready. With your right hand, you manipulate the lighter. But one moment, please. He picked up the chopper. We are all ready, he said. Mr. Referee, you must say to begin. Are you ready? I asked the boy. I'm ready. And you? To the little man. Quite ready, he said, and lifted the chopper up in the air and held it about two feet above the boy's finger. The boy watched it, but he didn't flinch. All right, I said. Go ahead. The boy said, Will you please count aloud the number of times I light it? Yes, I said. With his thumb, he raised the top of the lighter, and again with the thumb, he gave the wheel a sharp flick. The flint sparked, and the wick caught fire and burned with a small yellow flame. One, I called. He didn't blow the flame out. He closed the top of the lighter on it, and he waited for perhaps five seconds before opening it again. He flicked the wheel very strongly, and once more there was a small flame burning on the wick. Two. No one else said anything. The boy kept his eyes on the lighter. The little man held the chopper up in the air, and he too was watching the lighter. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Obviously, it was one of those lighters that worked. I took a breath, ready to say eight. The thumb flicked the wheel. The flint sparked. The little flame appeared. Eight, I said. And as I said it, the door opened. We all turned, and we saw a woman standing in the doorway, a small, black-haired woman, rather old, who stood there for about two seconds, then rushed forward, shouting, Carlos! She grabbed his wrist, took the chopper from him, threw it on the bed, took hold of the little man by the lapels of his white suit, hauled him across the room, and pushed him backwards onto one of the beds. I am sorry, the woman said. I am so terribly sorry that this should happen. She spoke almost perfect English. I suppose it is really my fault. For ten minutes I leave him alone, and I come back here, and he is at it again. The boy was untying his hand from the table. He is a menace, the woman said. Down where we live at home, he has taken altogether forty-seven fingers from different people, and he has lost eleven cars. In the end, they threatened to have him put away somewhere. That's why I brought him up here. We were only having a little bet, mumbled the man from the bed. I suppose he bet you a car, the woman said. Yes, the boy answered, a Cadillac. He has no car. It's mine. He hasn't anything left to bet with.
the woman said. As a matter of fact, I myself won it all from him a long while ago. It took time, a lot of time, and it was hard work, but I won it all in the end. She looked up at the boy, and she smiled a slow, sad smile, and she came over and put out a hand to take the key from the table. I can see it now, that hand of hers. It had only one finger on it, and a thumb. Thank you.